I would, again, as an amateur historian, I would see similarities between the uh, famous uh, scholars at the University of Padua in Italy who refused to look through, supposedly, <laughs> through uh, Galileo's telescope, he had an early right. telescope, which was pretty right. cruddy, but right. still good enough uh, to show very interesting right. and surprising things, shocking right. things at the time, like the moons of Venus. Right. And so his colleagues, apparently, uh, smart people, uh, very smart people, simply yep. refused to look, and this kind of a famous movie scene about all these marvelously dressed uh, scholars kind of from the Middle Ages with these wonderful graduation gowns. They weren't graduation gowns yep. at the time, of course, but we think of them as graduation gowns. And they're coming kind of in, in, a, in a little squad marching along on the Padua wonderful, <laughs> wonderful campus. And Galileo yeah. supposedly is, is yelling at them, come and watch, come and watch, Say, look through the telescope. And they supposedly sneered at him and walked away. They didn't want to see it. Uh, and that is, I think, a human universal. There's all kinds of things that we don't want to see. In fact, there are things I can tell you that I don't want to see. And then, there, of course, there are some things that we yell at each other to come and see. And right. if there is a difference between myself and Stan, which is not major, it's that I'm very interested in the dialogue between observations and theory, and so is Stan, of course. But Stan believes the theories that come out of it, and I think they're pretty amazing. But I have two levels of belief, I guess, where I believe what Galileo was seeing through his telescope, and I also believe the theoretical ideas that were so hotly debated at that time. Stan and I are having this metaphysical fight, and Stan is right, and I'm wrong. But then, on the other hand, sometimes we're both right, but we're not both right in <laughs> ways that we you know, can agree on every syllable of the way in which I think Stan is right, which I do. And I also think that I'm right because I've been trying to be right forever, just like Stan has. And what we're seeing, what appears to be a difference between us is really part of the duet that appears in science and other parts of real life, of course, it appears all, all the time, where you seem to be having an argument but you're really searching for where you agree and where you disagree. And in the history of science, working out the precise way in which you agree with each other and the ones in which you disagree with each other, that precise dialogue is science. Without that dialogue, I would argue that we're not talking about science. We're not even talking about honest scholarship in any other part of the world. I think lawyers argue with each other to gain clarity in problems, very, very difficult problems of law and ethics. Insurance salespeople argue with each other in order to establish the price of risk. Married people, family members argue with each other in order to establish a shared understanding and a shared misunderstanding of life. And it's the dialogue that is, uh, in my view, both the opportunity to disagree and also the opportunity to find common ground. So that's my commercial here. So we're doing the same thing. We both try to do scientific thinking, and we both look at established facts and novel facts that keep on creeping up on us in unexpected ways. So we do science in the best way that we know how, and we agree with each other on, I think, just about every single fact. Well... But you would agree, I presume, that you have some opinions that are not fully compatible 
with modern science, as I recall, that you have some objections. Yeah. So here's the thing that's really important. You have a view of modern science, and I have a view of modern science, and they're both uh, well-based in enormous amounts of evidence. So I like to tell people to take a look at uh, what I think is the greatest treasury of documented science on the web, which is very easy to find on a website called PubMed, P-U-B-M-E-D, dot government, dot G-O-V. And whenever I have a moment of doubt about what's true and what's not, I go to PubMed and type into the search engine whatever I'm curious about, uh, which is practically everything in the biosciences, which includes psychology. And I type in conscious brain. That's my favorite right now. And what comes up is between 2,500 and sometimes 20,000 articles, all of them from excellent peer-reviewed journals, journals that are very, very reputable and generally quite respected when we don't argue about them, which is all the time. So that's my treasury of what I think is considered to be science by people who are working right now. So all kinds of extraordinary brain discoveries keep on showing up in PubMed. And I talk about PubMed simply because it's an enormous simplification. It's what the computer age, Stan's cell phone, has contributed to our ability to understand the universe. And then people who spend their lives trying to understand the universe, like Stan, goes to his sources, and he defines what he considers to be science, which is a true and well-supported definition. So Stanley, basically, in the early to mid 20th century, physics was a very popular field, as you mentioned. A lot of scientists flocked to it, partially inspired by the discoveries of the early minds of the 20th century and World War II. However, after the 50s and the 60s, and that's when we had string theory, it feels like the field has been more or less stagnant. Have we hit a brick wall? What do we need to do to get back on those great discoveries in order to maybe figure out dark matter or dark energy? Do we need more computational power, more computers, or do we just need more human beings behind a project? How do we move physics to the next level? 